Maharashtra Institute of Technology, which is popularly known as MIT Aurangabad, is a leading institute in the state of Maharashtra and mainly catering to the techno managerial education at undergraduate as well as postgraduate level. Apart from having conventional courses like civil engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, computer science, and electronics engineering, we also have the specialized courses like agricultural engineering and plastics and polymer engineering. Apart from this, we also have the postgraduate courses in mechanical engineering, electronics engineering, computer science engineering and food processing technology at MTech level. We also have MBA and the research centers are available for doing PhD in mechanical engineering and electronics engineering. Highly qualified faculty members is the backbone of MIT Aurangabad and we have faculty members having their qualifications like MTech and PhD from very renowned institutes within India like IITs and NITs as well as the reputed universities from abroad. MIT is always known for the state of the art laboratories right from its inception and now we have introduced a new concept of micro enterprises under which we have introduced two new laboratories namely one is MIT CARS that is Center for Analytical Research and Studies in which very high end equipments are available for soil testing, water testing, food testing testing and even environmental testing. Second laboratory is MSIP, which is MIT Center for Industry Relevance in Polymer Science. In this laboratory, the actual production machines are installed and students are not required to go to industry for their implant training or to see the actual production. In this laboratory itself, they can learn all these things. So learning regarding the production as well as all operations can be done in this laboratory by all the students. So in 8th semester, all our students go to industry for their implant training. For successful implementation of this activity, we have the tie-up with uh, more than 300 industries which regularly offer implant training to our students and thereby the placement is also enhanced for all our students. With best infrastructure and very good faculty members and the student friendly environment, we are able to attract even the international students on our campus. And hence, I would like to invite all the aspirants to come to MIT and experience this joyful learning on the vibrant campus of MIT Aurangabad. Come, explore and understand MIT Aurangabad. Hello everyone and welcome you all to today's session. Thank you for taking time out and joining us for today's webinar. I am Bhagwan Toksha, Assistant Professor at Maharashtra Institute of Technology, Aurangabad. Maharashtra Institute of Technology, Aurangabad is the educational institute imparting technical education and accredited with A grade by NAC. We have among us Dr. Santosh Bosle, Principal, Dr. Kishore Kulkarni, Vice Principal Academics, Professor Makrand Vaishno, Vice Principal Administration and Professor Sachin Lomte, Head Basic Sciences and Humanities Department. Our team, Dr. Lina Uttarwar, Rashmi Suryavanshi, Nihit Agrawal and Abhijit Gurav, welcome you all. I request Principal Sir to uh, give an address on uh, the occasion of World Environment Day. Over to you Sir. Uh, good morning all, uh, I Dr. Santosh Bosle, Principal Maharashtra Institute of Technology, uh, welcome you all to this webinar on energy and environment uh, challenges and opportunities by Dr. Nitin Lapshetwar, uh, who is an expert in this field and uh, Chief Scientist and Head Energy and Resource Management division CSIR Niri Nagpur with whom the uh, 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 MIT has already uh, got an MOU and I'm sure with his expertise all the participants will be enlightened uh, on the occasion of this World Environmental Day 
I wish you all the best for uh, this World Environment Day. My best wishes to you all and thank you. Thank you very much. Over to you, sir. Thank you, sir, for your kind words. A bit of housekeeping at the beginning. If you have any questions during the presentation, please post them into comment section. That's all from my side. Yes, sir. A bit of housekeeping at the beginning. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into comment section. We will have time for questions at the end. A feedback form will be uh, shared with you. Please take time and fill the feedback form mentioning your correct credentials. You will receive a certificate by email. Now, without further ado, I will introduce our presenter today, Dr. Nitin Lapshetwar. Dr. Nitin Lapshetwar, Chief Scientist and Head, Energy Resources, Energy and Resources Management Division. He is a Professor of Academy of Scientific and Innovation, Innovative Research, CSIR, National Environmental Engineering Research Institute, NERI. He has done his PhD in chemistry with 32 years of experience in environmental and energy related research. He has worked as a visiting professor and has also worked at various international laboratories on development of materials and processes, including low cost and catalytic materials for energy and environmental applications. He has over 160 research publications at his credit and citations more than 4,800. He has 22 international patents and has contributed in various books. He has received many awards and recognitions for excellence in research and also received various fellowships in India and abroad. He is actively involved in rural and cooking energy related projects. He is currently involved in more than 12 research and development projects. So our today's speaker, Dr. Nitin Lakshatwar, over to you, sir. Good morning, a very good morning. Uh, thanks for the kind word and uh, thank you very much for organizing this uh, seminar. Welcome you all, welcome all the participants uh, for this uh, webinar. And uh, I also wish uh, on behalf of me, on behalf of my institute, uh, a very happy World Environment Day. And uh, as we understand, uh, there are many news, uh, many quotations, many things coming on the occasion of uh, World Environment Day. And today's theme is uh, biodiversity. While there are a few very interesting things uh, which are emerging from the United Nations as well as uh, from individual sources and the institutional sources. Something like uh, time for nature, okay? Uh, together we can act for nature. So we'll continue to see how the issues of uh, environment, the challenges of environment and energy has become a part of it actually are evolving and how best we are going to handle it. This is how I planned uh, my presentation for today. Very brief uh, details what we are doing uh, towards sustainable development at uh, NIDI and those who are interested they can contact me separately because uh, what I have planned here today is uh, looking at the very interdisciplinary uh, audience or participants and uh, they range from very senior teachers, the principals and a good number of students. So upfront apologies to the seniors and experts who are from this field because we are, I'm going to deal with some basic things which they are fully aware of because my objective is to you know, like highlight and clarify the challenges uh, we are facing and more importantly how best we can contribute. So just uh, ignore those who are expert in this area but you will definitely find something useful. This is how we will go to briefly look into the energy scenario and so called energy environment nexus. And uh, I'll take up a couple of things. One is a carbon footprint, which I personally feel is a very important. Then, global warming related issues and climate change related issues. How do we deal with the cleaner energy? And there are some less addressed issues because I firmly believe that uh, being a national lab, national environmental engineering lab, needy. It is our responsibility to look into the plight of poor, the plight of people, or the issues where probably there are no commercial gains, but those are serious environmental issues. And finally, how best you can contribute. You know about the sustainable development goals, and I personally feel right now the time has come that the sustainable development goal, SDG number 12, 
we should adopt and adopt very seriously. What is that? Responsible consumption and production. We'll look into that. I feel proud to be uh, associated with CSIR and then with the NEDI. A range of activities. So we probably deal with uh, almost everything uh, related to environmental science and engineering. Few things we go in the details. Few things uh, probably we just started. Okay, but there are different uh, divisions, and you, I would strongly recommend that you should go through the NEDI's website, www.nidi.res.s or uh, .in. And uh, there are a few interesting activities. We call it a CSIR internet or those related to you know like the underprivileged people, mostly from the rural sectors. Uh, we have about 115 scientists uh, and other technical and administrative staff. But importantly, I would mention that we have more than 250 very young, bright, and energetic uh, students at different levels. And they are a very big workforce and mind force for DD. We work throughout the country. There was an accident, I think, like, uh, two weeks back in the Vishakhapatnam. And DD was there even during the lockdown. Uh, and this is our sectoral presence. So the colleagues from different division and uh, our director, who is uh, from environmental engineering background, Dr. Rakesh Kumar, he's uh, spearheading our institute very, very uh, efficiently. These are our contribution to the national missions. And as I mentioned, being a national lab, it is our responsibility to contribute to the national mission. And we are quite active in that. These are some of the technologies uh, we have recently commercialized and which are making headlines sometimes. Uh, you can again check uh, the Institute's website. This is the group uh, I lead. We call it the Energy and Resource Management Division. We deal with uh, both, uh, you know, like the cleaner energy side and energy application side. So, diesel emission control. We are working, including recently, we started working on the problem of the old, uh, you know, like the vehicle. That's a big problem because we are we are already moved to the Euro six. But what about more than 250 million or 25 crore old vehicle which will keep on polluting our environment? So with the you know, other institutes, uh, we started working on that. And a colleague of mine works on clean energy through fuel cell. CO2 capture, I'm going to uh, show you through some of these things due to time limitations. Well, coming to the today's uh, seminar, or rather webinar, thanks to the unprecedented situation we have gone through, but uh, this we are finding a very effective medium or means of communicating. You must be reading in the newspaper if you follow energy, you will get conflicting news articles, okay? India's coal import rising while we talk about the clean energy. And the very next day you will see something like, we are having another solar plant, which uh, India is doing impressively well in case of renewables. Then suddenly there will be news, which will be difficult for you to understand that the thermal power project of almost 2.5 lakh crore facing stress. And you'll be wondering why do we need new thermal power project? Okay. Then we are making a lot of greening efforts. Okay. And there are social news, many other news. When I was a child about 20 years ago, energy means in India providing electricity to rural homes, minimizing load setting, and all these kind of things. Well, today, if you ask uh, even an engineering student, he would say energy symbolizes probably pollution, probably climate change. There are so many health impacts. Of course, on a positive note, renewables. But there are regional conflicts, okay? And last year, probably we saw a couple of years back, countries' economic jerks because of the oil prices. And it has become a strategic thing. So in the last two decades for India, the energy completely changed. If you go by the latest IEA, International Energy Agency report, this is how we traveled in the energy sector from 1900 to this century 20, and then finally last 20 years. If you see around here, around 2020, now you could easily recognize there was a Spanish flu and the demand was, you know, like down. There was a great depression, economic depression. There have been a few more. This is Second World War, the first oil shock, second oil shock, there was a global financial crisis around 2009, and now all of us are struggling with a new crisis, that is Corona, COVID-19, and <clears throat> the energy growth is down almost by close to 6 to 7%. Well, many of you must be wondering that we have such an impressive growth of renewables, especially solar in India. But if you see the outlook of the future of uh, energy demand, okay, it's not going to be all renewables, okay? Still, 
around 2040, it will be dominated by maybe carbon-based fuels, unless there's something revolutionary comes. The reason, despite having a wonderful growth in the renewable, our energy demand is increasing, and increasing very rapidly, okay? And that basically neutralizes that all the good work is going in this sector. So we should be prepared that there are going to be a lot of carbon-based fuels used in the future, and they are going to contribute to the CO2 or the climate change, as well as the other local pollutions. Few things about the impact of COVID-19, everybody is talking about that. India is also facing the brunt of it and facing it very severely. You can see when there were limited restrictions, a limited lockdown we call commonly in India. Okay, this was the <clears throat> energy demand was down close to 15%, and the partial lockdown and full lockdown, it was more than 30%. Okay. Similarly, electricity mix, if you see from January to April, okay, but China it is picking up and you know the China is brown and India brown. We are largely dependent on the coal-based energy. US is based on the gas-based energy, while European Union is having an impressive renewables. So this is how the trend is changing, okay, when it comes to the energy. If you see the India, renewable is increasing. Actually, your overall energy demand is decreasing. So we are uh, utilizing renewables more efficiently. We are, you know, like uh, controlling the coal-based power plant, which is not so easy, okay. Now, this is the projected change in the primary energy demand, okay, as compared to the last year. And this is going to be around 5 to 8% of different energy sector, while the energy of renewable will improve. Looks like good, because we are reducing the carbon-based fuel. But this is at the cost of the economy. You all understand very easily. Now, coming to the basics of uh, energy and environment, many people call it the energy environment nexus. There are two major challenges when it comes to the energy as far as environmental challenges are concerned. One, we all know greenhouse gas emissions like CO2 or methane, okay, which is a global issue, which is also related to the climate change. And a lot of emphasis is going on on this. Second is a conventional pollution. And sometimes I feel because of the climate change priorities, these are taking sometimes the back seat. What is the air pollution, the local air pollution, the water pollution, soil pollution? issues of exposure to these kind of uh, knocks or the fly ash, okay, and their health impact. There are local issues. Well, these are the two basic impacts of energy, but we do not normally understand what are the indirect impact which can be assessed or which can be studied through an approach which many of you are familiar with called life cycle assessment or LCA, okay. Now look at the first impact, which is the CO2 emissions, which we're talking correlating it to the climate change, okay, during 1900 to 2020. It's gradually increasing and then it's rapidly increasing. And this red dot is showing a small decrease because of the COVID-19 situation and the CO2 emissions. And everybody is feeling happy about it, that look, we have done something good to the nature. Before that, we have reached to a state that where it has become a social issue as well. Okay, this is probably from the Australia where the kids left the school, in fact, they skipped the school and they said, you know, like uh, fighting for climate change is probably more important for us because we are in the school to make our career for, to making our life. But how about it is going to be devastated by the climate change? Now, see the effect of lockdown on the CO2 emissions uh, by detail, okay? India down by almost 8%, more than 8%, Europe, United States substantially down and even the rest of the world, okay? So there's a huge, huge, uh, I would say, small uh, benefit in terms of the control of the CO2 emissions. This is the effect of lockdown on the ambient air pollution. And also Nidhi has done a uh, study and we are going to soon come out with uh, more data. For Nagpur, we have done, we also proven that there was a substantial reduction in the lockdown. We see a lot of WhatsApp messages, a lot of uh, newspaper clippings about these beautiful scenes across the world that the dolphins are flying, um, swimming back, okay? The biodiversity, you can see the animals are having a free time, a gala time, they are entering the cities and the human habitats, okay? And there are a few rumors also that the, probably the ozone hole has uh, been recovered, okay? But, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, there are no scientific basis for certain claims, but changes are visible and visible very prominently. This is today's uh, Times of India. And week before environment day, country sees the cleanest air in the last five years. 
But at the same time, today's newspaper also tells us that the COVID-19 pandemic getting to the plastic pollution. So we are already compensating for a few things, okay? That we are generating a lot of masks, a lot of PPEs, and as usual, we are disposing them in a very irresponsible manner. What is the brief of this COVID-19 situation is most of the changes are temporary, okay? We should understand these are temporary. We are already easing the lockdown, okay? So these are very small impact in emissions and all these things. This is not going to improve the climate change because it's just a couple of months, okay? And if you see the CO2 concentration, the global concentration, not the global emissions, the global concentrations, obviously these are hardly changed and these are unchanged in fact. This is only the best validation of the fact that anthropogenic activities for which we all are responsible are creating pollution. Okay, what has been scientifically estimated through emission inventory studies or source of measurement studies, now there's a direct evidence that once you stop the vehicles, these pollutions are pollution levels are going down. Once you stop your factories, once you stop polluting the river, rivers are being, uh, becoming very clean. And there's a you know like a lot of blame game that you stop the country's activities for a month and everything is clean. Come on, okay. If you keep on like this, you'll not survive. Okay, so what is the way forward? We have to understand that, yes, we were responsible, the anthropogenic activities were responsible for this state of nature, and nature is so power to have a healing, okay, it can back normal if you stop polluting it. So we need to really work with that. So I told you that these are the two important aspects of the pollution related to energy, and as you have seen in the background, I just wanted to clarify you that, yes, there are some impacts, positive impact on the COVID-19 lockdown, but those are temporary, and we all understand how it is. So let's first look into the CO2 problem or the GHG emissions because they are very, very important. And this is a cumulative effect of several decades. It's not going to go on maybe three months or four months of lockdown. Okay. This is a projected uh, temperature change as uh, <clears throat> suggested by IPCC and many other uh, credible agencies. If you don't act it could be as high as 4.5 degree, okay? And based on the Paris Pledge, the Paris Agreement, it could be 2.7 degree, but that is also a phenomenal increase which could have very devastating impact. We are left with hardly 12 years to limit the global warming to 1.5 degrees. We need to act very fast, okay? And there is not going to be locked down forever. Why a high half degree temperature rise a big deal? You must be wondering that since this is the global normal temperature and half degree doesn't make a sense or much impact. So is the two degree. There will be a lot of climate change, uh, you know, like uh, events. And I don't have to convince you. You are very much familiar of uh, Fan, Nisarga, okay, and now they're predicting a few more, okay. So people are saying that every, everything is changing. More importantly, you know, like you're going to get 100% or close to normal rainfall this year in India. But you can still see a distributed precipitation pattern. What does it mean? In one part of the country, it may be heavily raining, while another part will go drought. And the average you will find is very good. Okay, So precipitation pattern is changing, which is more dangerous probably than the drought. And IPCC had warned it way back. And these are coming true. So it is high time we should start accepting the facts where we are getting a direct, you know, like the impact of it. This is few more things. Many of you must be aware. Warming of ocean, okay, and uh, sea level rise, and all the coastal cities will be very, very vulnerable to the sea level rise. What are the other consequences of global warming? As we understand, and I have taken a couple of slides from this uh, internet presentation, and I make sure that I am giving sources from where, and I would like to profoundly acknowledge that. As far as climate change is concerned, this is a very generic thing, and it is going to impact all the sectors. Okay, you name the sector, it is going to impact it. This is way back, they showed this pic of ice sheet melting, okay, which will be responsible for ocean level rise. Now, these are the friends of the nature and friends of ours we have lost forever, okay, because these are the extinct species. Unless you see them frequently and show to your student and show to your kids frequently, they will feel that, oh, there are millions of them. Millions of them are there, and few of them we lose. It is a matter. If you see a parakeet, a parrot, 
Okay, there are hundreds of varieties. Let's lose one. Or Japanese sea lion, doesn't matter. It's not that simple. It's not that simple. We should take it very seriously. Now, many of the students, when I give these kind of talks, they ask, or rather sometimes I ask, that the polar bear is going to be extinct. They say, yes, sir, it's a serious problem. And when I ask, have you seen polar bear? The majority says, no. And then I ask, what problem you have if the polar bear is not there? You haven't even seen polar bear. Okay, and sometimes they wonder, yes, what is the issue? Even if you lose the tiger, the tiger is at the top of the food chain. If there are no tigers, maybe the other, you know, like fauna will be flourishing, other animals will be flourishing. Okay, that means we need to tell them about the biodiversity losses. Okay, this is a Facebook thing and is a logical, you know, like presentation. These are two pics combined by somebody. The locust attack in India, hey human, now you are missing this bird, okay? And there are scientific reports and there are credible reports where they were talking about the birds eating the locust, okay? And because of the decreasing bird population and probably increase in the some phenomena related to the environment, the locust attacks are there. I was talking to my colleague and she is a biologist and she was mentioning as of today, as far as biodiversity is concerned, whatever I have shown you that these species are extinct, we do not even know 40% of the animal kingdom. I am talking the 40% of the animal kingdom. Probably same goods through with the plant and over 90% of the microorganisms, we do not have understanding, we do not have knowledge. The scientists are working, the academicians are working to identify those species. So we are playing very much in the dark. These are enormous species and a very large number of species might get extinct before we could identify them, before we could recognize them. And if you only try to bother about the big animals like tiger or the elephant or the birds and all these things, please try to understand. Now we got a very, very bad experience of a very small thing called coronavirus. Okay, it's a microorganism. So they are very, very important for something good and for something bad about it. So cost of bio biodiversity, this is the like uh, direct loss. And if you try to understand these 90% of the microorganisms, which we do not actually know about it, they are existing everywhere. Probably they are somewhere in the gut microflora, probably on the skin of some animal or probably on the tree. So if you're cutting down that tree and making it extinct, or if you're making some animal extinct, you do not know how many microorganisms you are losing and how useful those were to control some pathogenic virus growth or to control some harmful bacteria. Okay, so these losses or these impacts could be devastating. So the best thing is don't touch nature, don't destroy nature, and nature can take care of itself. Now the question is the CO2 is becoming such a huge problem, so we need to understand two things. One is where do these emissions come from? They are so big because the first good thing will be to control them. And second thing, to do something with that, how to use them. Let us see. The carbon footprint, I wish all the teachers, especially in the engineering colleges and in the school, they teach these things and they tell these things to the students. It's very, very easy to understand. The only tricky thing about the carbon footprint is about the direct emissions and the indirect emissions or the direct footprint and the indirect footprint. What are the direct footprint? I had one and a half liter of water or two liter of water. That is my water footprint as far as drinking is concerned. Another 10 liter to four, I mean, to take shower or maybe 20 liters. And overall, maybe I have consumed about say 150 to 200 liter of water. This is only your dot, no, direct water footprint. Okay. We'll see what is the direct or indirect water footprint. So we don't talk about indirect losses, okay, or indirect emissions which have been there to produce anything you are eating or drinking or using it. Look at the shirt. 2,700 liters of water is required to produce cotton leaf uh, shirt. Okay, over 100 billion garments were produced for the first time in 2014. You can multiply. And you can get a mind boggling figure for that. 60% of all clothing ends up to incinerator and landfill within a year of being made. 60% increase was reported in the number of garments. Okay. 
So it's very easy for us. You only talk about the improving economy, and of course it is very much required. But we should talk about the responsible consumption. We should minimize our the comments, okay, our need, and also we should produce them in a much sustainable way. These are the trends, okay, which should come, and I wish it should start from some colleges like the MIT. Okay. You should also identify and make some small competition with how sustainable your output. outfit. Let's try to understand. And these are very interesting things. All the students will be quite interested in this. Okay, my shirt has this kind of a water footprint. My shirt has this kind of a, you know, like the carbon footprint or the CO2 footprint. This is my footprint uh, related to my mobility and all these things. Suppose uh, you're cycling, which is the best way because uh, it doesn't uh, give any emissions. Imagine a person who is doing dieting through cycling. So he's eating too much and then going for the cycling. If he's eating banana, it will be 65 gram of CO2, but uh, if he's uh, eating a cheeseburger, it will be 260 gram. He's not doing any favor. Okay? Sometimes it is equivalent to moving the car. So these are the indirect or hidden, you know, like the footprint. Another example I'll give you, it's very easy to calculate the CO2 footprint or the carbon footprint of a car. We all understand the car is usually run on petroleum, which is a carbon-based fuel or the fossil fuel. If you run for 100 kilometers, you will be burning say, 6 liters. You can calculate how much of CO2 you have produced. Have you ever thought how much of CO2 emissions are emitted when a car is produced in a factory? Those are very significant. What does it mean? After two years of driving or three years of driving, it met with an accident several hundreds of thousands of cars are met with an accident. You have already lost a huge amount of CO2 which have gone into the atmosphere for production of that car. A web search, very small, 0.2 gram, very useful, everybody's need, but we should be very efficient for the web search. If I'm using a 10 search, if I can manage a 2 search and imagine several billion people using it. So every activity we do has a water footprint, has a carbon footprint. Household are the big contributor to climate change, and these are some of the estimates for a cup of tea, 21 gram of CO2, 53 gram of CO2 for a different, it ranges up to 340 gram for the latte, okay. If you know, there are very credible evidences of the water footprint of tea and coffee, and sometimes it runs about 50 liter of water for one cup of tea or coffee. I don't say you should not drink it. These are made to enjoy. These are made to drink. Please don't waste it. Even if you're leaving half the cup of tea, it's not a half a cup of tea. Probably you're wasting 30 or 40 liters of water. And from where this water footprint comes from? You have to grow a plant. It requires a lot of water. goes for the evaporation. goes for the processing. CO2 comes from the transportation and many other things. So you should start understanding and start value value anything you are consuming, any resources, and be very, very responsible. This is the carbon footprint of what you eat. Everybody knows that the non-rich food has a high carbon footprint. It is compared almost like a car. You are running a car when you are eating a non-rich food. So there are local vegetarian food which should be preferred over the non-rich food. So we need to look into the carbon footprint of all resources we are consuming, okay, all the energy options we are planning. Also, we need to look into the carbon footprint of final energy delivery and application, okay? You know, like 15 years back, I remember when the solar was introduced and people used to ask the student question, any emissions from the solar panel? They said, no, they are completely forgetting during those times. The photovoltaic chip used to be produced using a very high energy processes, high temperature energy processes, okay? And it, was having such a huge high uh, CO2 footprint during the first generation and before that, that it used to take a couple of years to use that solar cell to compensate for the CO2 which was emitted during the production of that solar cell. But now we have a new generation of uh, solar cell during which production the CO2 emissions are not very high. Similarly, you should also understand the uh, CO2 footprint of LPG. It's not very easy that somebody says that Give me the formula of LPG and I will calculate what is the footprint of, uh, say, making a cup of tea or boiling a rice. It's not that easy. You should also calculate the 
the energy requirement for extraction of oil, its transportation from Saudi Arabia to India, then refinery related CO2 footprint, the transportation of LPG from the refinery to my cities in Akur, then the bottling plant uses energy, then the transportation of cylinder from bottling plant to my say delivery place, from delivery place to my building, and from my building, the fellow is using my elevator or lift to transport that cylinder along with some five, six, seven kgs of cylinder to carry, it requires energy. So that is the overall footprint. It's not easy that I have only consumed 14.5 kg of LPG, okay? There's a huge amount of indirect footprint associated with everything. So one best options and uh, uh, good opportunity for chemical engineering students or mechanical engineering students to try out different products or different resources or different energy options and do the life cycle assessment and these are very contextual okay in india you will find the footprint is different the environmental footprint is different in any other country you will find it different so please train your students for this like for the coal energy i have already explained to you we normally don't count the water requirement we normally don't count the carbon footprint related to the mining and many other things now look at the some of the very very uh, astonishing figures right got this slide from uh, Dr. Sonde, who is one of the best experts as well as energy area is concerned. Do we care for the way energy is generated? This is how we generate the energy. The genset efficiency in general is about a you wider know, range, in fact, maybe 20 to 38 percent. Some critical, super critical, these are the different options for generating uh, electricity or power. The efficiency is maximum around 40 percent, okay? GT combined cycle, which is rare there. Transmission and distribution losses of another 20% we have to add, okay? So what is left with you overall? It's about close to 20%, okay? So whatever theoretical energy is there with the coal, okay? Finally, at your doorstep or at your house it is coming, okay? Probably you are losing almost, uh, you know, like uh, more than 50 or 60% of the energy. There are a lot of opportunities for the innovation here. Now you see the demand size scenario. Once the electricity has come to your office or the industry or you know, like at your home, compression works at about 30% maximum. Illumination now is going good with LED. Automobiles about 30-35%. Furnaces almost similar range. Air conditioner 40% of the best. Cook stove less than 50% sometimes. Best is 30%. And the combined efficiency is about less than 10%. What does it mean? We're talking too much about the CO2. We are talking that during the COVID, probably 2% or 5% of the CO2 emissions are less or reduced. If you can control 10% of the CO2 emission, very big deal. But do you realize that close to 80% or 85% of the CO2 emissions are simply puffed off in the air because of the poor efficiency of energy generation and the poor efficiency of energy utilization? Okay. Again, there are opportunities for innovation. It's not easy to bring it down to 50% or 60%. But if you can improve by 1% or 2%, it makes a lot of difference. So it's not like uh, we have to actually reduce the consumption. Yes, we have to definitely, but that's not the only way. If you improve the energy efficiency per se of the production as well as utilization, there's a great chance that we can probably control the CO2 emissions. Everybody says we are already fed up with the problems. Solutions, please. What are the solutions? My answer to that, probably you are the solutions. How? If you see in 2010, there's a very nice uh, story about the Empire State Building in the United States, that they have done a deep energy retrofit. First, they have done an energy audit and the energy retrofit. And they cut down the emissions by 40% and energy requirement very, very substantially. And now they are aiming for another effort because there is an advancement in the technologies and you can do that. There's better understanding how to do that. So this is one of the best example for, you know, like replication. What can we do? Personal choices to reduce, you should go for the low impact thing, okay? These are some of the low impact, moderate impact and the high impact. What you need to do, you need to make your students or your you know, like friends aware of it. Individual action, we can do a lot, okay? Use renewable energy, 
use uh, efficient uh, energy devices, okay, and make sure that you are shutting off all the devices whenever they are not under use. This is the role of an inducer, and that's why I call it a probably responsible consumption and production and reducing the waste will take care in a big deal. Many things you'll find, I'm not going to go into the details, okay, but these are very much available with the BCRA websites or the popular website, and we should uh, definitely organize some kind of a debate, many activities to make them aware uh, to the everybody. This is your home. It could save as much CO2 as, you know, like 6.5 acres of tree or 458 barrel of unburned oil by making few tips, few energy saving tips. Now moving to the cleaner energy, uh, I'm very happy to say that uh, Government of India or India overall is doing very, very good. And some of the slides are taken from Dr. Bharat Bhargav. Okay. The uh, advantage with India, although we get a huge amount of heat, okay, it can be turned into an, uh, energy as an energy resource. The radiation can be very, very efficiently utilized, and we are now efficiently utilizing. This is the India solar resource or solar map of India. Okay. This is the direct uh, normal light, and this is the horizontal solar resource. Nowadays, there are advanced devices which can utilize the solar radiations in a more and more efficient way. So we have a huge potential, more than even 750 gigawatt potential. This is the wind energy potential for India. Okay, India is a team started doing good as far as wind energy is concerned. These are the major applications of solar energy. Way back we are using solar heater and other heating devices, but now you can easily use the cooling. You can, of course, manufacture a lot of electricity. Okay. There are many potential innovations I can see, and there are many startups I can see because the new applications are more or less focusing on the livelihood, okay, agri processing, especially the drying, okay, the biomass drying, even the health related aspects. The low temperature waste heat now is available because you know, like there were four or five ways of generating uh, heat or generating electricity or energy. Now there are at least 10 or 15. There are many new processes where waste heat is available, and that gives you a good opportunity, you know. And there are device innovations. So you must try all these things. This is a solar water heater at uh, Godavari Fertilizer. Okay, this is another uh, solar based uh, large cooking system. These are the solar thermal power plant in India. These are the biomass based gasifier systems in Sundarbar. And there are hundreds of stories. So, one way we need to reduce the energy footprint okay, of uh, whatever energy you are producing, it should be much cleaner energy, it should have a low CO2 emissions. But as I mentioned to you in my initial slides, whatever efforts you are making, those are getting neutralized because your energy demand is increasing. What does it mean? Whatever you are doing with the renewables, there will be still substantial amount of carbon-based fuel used and they will continue to produce CO2. So we need to now also simultaneously work on CO2 reduction. So there is a say power plant, coal-based power plant. It emits about uh, 14 to 15% or 13% of the CO2. Can you capture this CO2 and can you use this CO2 for something useful, to make some useful product? This is the best way to do that. You have to capture CO2 and then convert back into the fuel. Please keep in mind, while converting CO2 into the fuel, don't use so much of energy and that too from the carbon-based fuel. Otherwise, you will be converting CO2 into fuel and you will be releasing more CO2 than you, what you have converted. A process called chemical leaping combustion. Uh, we are working on that. Okay. This is basically oxyfuel combustion. You have a coal, you mix with air to burn it. Instead of air, if you can take oxygen, what it will give you? C plus O2 CO2, pure CO2. Isn't that easy? We don't even have the oxygen for our hospitals. How can you produce oxygen sufficient for a power plant? There is a possibility we can use metal oxides. This is just a brief things I'm giving for those who are having a chemical engineering and chemistry background. I'm not going to go into the detail considering the fact that you have a uh, very interdisciplinary audience. So you can use metal oxides, okay? And metal oxide becomes oxygen carrier and it is possible to use the oxygen present in the metal oxide and regenerate it. So we have done some interesting research and if you are interested, you can contact uh, us uh, separately. Uh, we have got a decent facility to do this work of chemical looping combustion and many chemical engineers are interested in that. So there is a CO2 capture process. Now you have a lot of CO2. What to do with this CO2? How to use it? 
So there are many options like uh, there are depleted oil and gas reservoirs where probably we can, it's called geological sequestration, but there are some consequences or environmental impact related to that. CO2 can be used in the CO2 based enhanced oil recovery. You can pressurize through CO2 and the oil or gas will come. There's a deep cell formation and there's the CO2 in enhanced cold bed methane recovery. So efforts are going on. There are many countries who are using it. How to sequester or how to convert CO2 to useful product? You have to keep in mind, CO2 is produced in such a, such a huge volume that if you want to produce something, your space or your, you know, like country will be flooded with that particular product. Okay. Because CO2 is enormous. So the best way is to convert CO2 into fuel or food. Okay. The nature is already converting CO2 into food through photosynthesis. If you can convert using uh, solar radiation to the fuel, it will be one of the good options. Okay, so please keep in mind what we are working on the CO2 reforming of methane to convert it into syngas, and from syngas, you can make methanol, you can make dimethyl ether. So, this is another RD we are actively pursuing along with a couple of collaborators. And if you are interested, we can talk separately. Uh, okay. Now I'm coming to more or less the last leg of uh, uh, my lecture, some interesting. Air pollution from cooking energy, and for those who are not aware, I think the 2015 WHO report says probably close to 9 lakh people died in India because of the air pollution from cook stove, the chula, okay, the cigarette we are using, the stoves in the rural home. And during that year, the death from the air pollution from other sources, including automobile and industry, were far, far less. But nobody was talking about it until we got now very impressive the LPG scheme through which a lot of people got benefited. And that's very, very uh, one of the best thing I have seen as far as cooking energy is concerned. But the problems are still not over because always remember we are a people of uh, we are a planet of about 7.8 billion people, and India is about close to 1.37 billion people. So one solution for everybody never fails. So right now, these are the challenges when it comes to the unorganized sector or the rural sector or the rural home. And we are we at Niri are working quite actively on these issues because they are related to the poor people. Okay, especially the problem of uh, you know like particulate matter emissions from solid fuels, especially the conventional or traditional cook store, is a very serious problem. And now because of the COVID-19 situation and the economic jerk we have got, many people are not even able to afford the subsidized LPG. And they are slipping back to those dirty fuels. So here we want to uh, provide them the options of clean cooking. Okay, Of course, it is not as clean as the LPG, but always remember LPG is not a renewable fuel. It has a carbon footprint. It will give us CO2 emissions and it is costly. So if your economic conditions are improving, you should go for the cleaner options like LPG, the solar based induction cooker. But for the next several years, we have to use even the improved cook stove. So we have developed our own cook stove, which uh, in terms of its energy uh, efficiency is one of the best. Generally, we get 15% very poor energy efficiency in the mud screw or the, you know, like the traditional cook stove. But here we got about 33 plus percent uh, efficiency and many families are now benefited. This is our dissimulation in four efforts of the, you know, like the social connect or the social efforts we make. More than a few thousand uh, cookstore we have distributed. Uh, we also established a cookstore testing and research lab uh, at Neely, and we are helping the MSMEs and the industries associated with this. Well, uh, there's a very good uh, benefits in terms of the health benefit and the environmental benefits. It saves a lot of fuel and many forest departments are also interested in that. There was a problem of, uh, you know, like emissions from the Tandoor in Delhi as identified by IIT Kanpur and our team, uh, including my colleagues, uh, Ankit and other students, they have developed, uh, you know, like an improved Tandoor. This I'm intentionally showing to you because these kind of a project can be easily done in the colleges. Okay. And you are in a much, much better position as far as the engineering understandings are concerned. So go for it. Next one is a problem of used sanitary pads and the mask disposal. Okay. These are staggering figures. You can even see today's times of India. These are some of the figures from Nagpur that probably Nagpur generate per day 10 tons of napkin based waste, sanitary uh, napkin based waste. And uh, they are a big biohazard. Okay. And we need to take care of that. 
you will be wondering why this problem is there. And when I uh, have gone through the literature search, I didn't find much of a literature from the Western world or the developed world because there the waste management system is in place. Okay. So this is a problem uh, of India and many other less developed countries, and we need to look into this and offer some solutions. This is today's newspaper, okay, where they're asking to adopt eco-friendly menstrual practices. This is the state of affair, okay, as far as oceans are concerned. Now, in addition to the sanitary napkins, you are finding the used masks. You can imagine how dangerous the situation is, okay. People are simply throwing them, okay. So we have to be very, very responsible. So Neri has developed a device uh, called uh, uh, Green Dispo. This is in association with ARC and Hyderabad and so on in industry. Okay, this takes care of the uh, used sanitary napkins in a more energy efficient way and environment friendly way. So I'm just uh, coming to an end, and then I'll show you two more slides, which is probably of the uh, most important for you people, especially those who are from the academic world. Here we can uh, conclude that the environmental challenges are getting severe and there are new and emerging pollutants are coming like selenium in water, many hydrocarbons in air and so, so on and so forth. There's no assimilatory capacity left. What is assimilatory capacity it means your, you know, like your atmosphere cannot tolerate your ambient air concentration. It's already saturated with these pollutants. So any addition is very, very, uh, is having a very severe health impact. While energy demand will increase, we must reduce the footprint. We must improve the energy efficiency. There's a great scope for that. Okay. And energy efficiency, or for that matter, if you ask me one buzzword, I would love to float efficiency. Whether it is a resource efficiency, energy efficiency, or consumption efficiency, anything. If you become efficient, probably half of the problems are gone. As I have proven you, even the CO2 reduction will be there. We have plenty of problems. You should take it as a plenty of opportunity for innovation, especially from the college uh, students. Okay, like as I uh, mentioned, you the waste can be used as a resource, and uh, we call it a resource mining. If you are utilizing the waste as a resource, okay, you must have seen the flood of innovations related to COVID-19. It can be done in other areas as well. Okay. Now the sanitizers and hand free and those kind of things are getting saturated, including the UV disinfection devices. We have done enough. Okay, it's time to use them and follow the social distancing. But the similar spirit, similar passion can be done for the other things. Now, engineering and science students are among the best talent available. We should spend more efforts on the projects or internship on the PhD topics. Okay. The dissertations and the project should be more meaningful and can be more meaningful. And trust me, those not necessary should be application based. Theoretical estimations. Many people do uh, work with us and they ask us to, sir, I have to make a catalytic converter. Then I need to tell them, don't get disappointed or disheartened. It's not easy. We are working for more than 15 years. Okay. There are thousands of people work. Thousands of people work together to develop one catalytic converter. But if you work on the heat transfer or the mass transfer or anything, you know, like it's very, very interesting. And this is no less than what you're doing. We have a few lax thesis every year, dissertations, internship. But I personally feel more thought process should go on to that. Okay. I spend a lot of time in Japan and for a small project, for a small work, a small dissertation. They spent hours together and days together of discussing. Okay. Because this is important for them. Another thing, yeah, where we lack and lack very badly is a prototype development and optimizing technology. There are many innovations available. When you transform that into a product, you have to go through the prototyping. Okay. But it takes months together. It's very complicated. And I heard in a country like China, there are industries, there are labs which develop on the prototype. Okay. And also finally make responsible of your students. Uh, this is a slightly negative quote, but very, very important to uh, have it from the Gus Peck, who is a big name. They say, I used to think the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that with the 30 years of good science, we could address those problems, but I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, apathy. And to deal with those, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And we scientists do not know how to do that. But the you teacher, you know. That's why I call you, I challenge you, you have to create a responsible citizen. Okay? Now, 
people come to me, my students come to me, how can I contribute to the national interest? Okay, there are patriotic feelings, which is always good. I ask them what are the big challenges and they come up with the COVID vaccine, uh, vaccine COVID medicine, COVID cure, landing of Chandrayaan probably in the last couple of years, border conflict and revival of economy. These are the big things. Why not you can contribute? Yes, you can contribute to climate change as I mentioned to you. You can contribute to the resource efficiency. You can contribute to the biodiversity. And the last request and urge to all of you, if you want to revive your economy and put your country back on the track, you know, not only one thing, it will be a cumulative impact of everything. If you are a teacher, if you are a student, if you are a mechanic, if I am a scientist, if you are a doctor, of course, doctor is contributing. You need to do more sincerely with passion, whatever you are doing, okay? Whatever you are doing, and all these things will contribute to the betterment of your country. So I'm asking my student to come back or work from home and work a little more harder because research is important, study is important. That's how you build a nation. So not necessarily you may be contributing directly to the COVID or the national challenges like the landing of Chandrayaan. But you need to work where you are, and that's how you are more efficient because you know your domain very well. Here I will end, and the last thing is uh, SDG I mentioned, Sustainable Development Goal. And you must be wondering, there's a sustainable SDG related to water, hunger, poverty, climate change. There is an SDG 17, which dedicate to the partnership, partnership to achieve these goals. How important it is. And I would urge and I'll be glad to do the partnership through which only we can achieve, we can attend both these things. Thank you very much uh, to all my colleagues, collaborators, students, and this is the work of all of them. Okay. And from the different information sources, I've taken care to kind of acknowledge them properly. And of course, the MIT Aurangabad for this opportunity. Thanks a lot for the patience hearing. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for a wonderful session and informative session. Now the session is open for question answer session. So the first question in the chat box is from Jyoti Bhavne. Okay, first question in the chat box is from Jyoti Bhavne. Can we stop or manage carbon emissions? Can we stop? Or manage carbon emissions? I'm not very clear about this question. See, the carbon emissions uh, we need to reduce, okay, and we can reduce, okay. Everything is uh, energy, okay, and energy means to some extent the carbon emissions. As I mentioned to you, the carbon footprint, just go through the basics of the carbon footprint and reduce your carbon footprint. You can definitely reduce your, uh, you know, like the CO2 emissions. Next question, please. Okay, sir. Next question is from Mr. Abhijit. Do you think that there are lessons to learn from nature? There are hundreds and thousands of lessons to not uh, learn from nature. Okay, like uh, revival of uh, nature during this COVID thing. Nature has got a very very strong healing capacity. Okay, nature is adjusting itself. We call it an evolving of nature. Okay, so many things. I was telling you one example only. I will give because of the short of time. The hmm. photosynthesis. Now we have got too much of carbon dioxide. We want to use it to convert into food. Okay, and hmm. photosynthesis is the best lesson. Uh, you know, like uh, nature is teaching us, and there is a lot of research going on of what is known as artificial photosynthesis, where all our scientific understanding and engineering understanding put together is giving a very very poor efficiency. As <laughs> so yes, we have a lot to learn from the nature. Yes, sir. Thank you. Next question is from Mr. Shivaji Borade. India is marching towards attaining SDGs 2030. Do you agree with this? Why not? You know, like SDGs are pretty broad. Uh, there are 17 SDG. It is related to everything. Okay. It's a big challenge. But uh, as uh, today we were focusing about the climate change, and as far as climate change and CO2 related uh, commitments are concerned and renewable energy expansion is concerned, I'm sure that India is uh, doing impressive, uh, uh, impressive, you know, like efforts. Second thing I would quote, like the vehicle emission control. Okay, we are already entered into Euro 6 and Euro 6 is called a world class standard, despite having a lot of uh, economic uh, problems and many other challenges we have. Okay. We are very ambitious and I'm sure there have been some jerk. Uh, okay, next question is from the 
how we convert co2 in fuel please explain the method briefly this is the question from deepmala desai it's really difficult to explain you briefly okay but you know like co2 we take it as a chemical as a molecule which contains c plus o2 okay first we need to do the activation mm. of that co bond okay and once it gets mm. activated then there is a possibility to convert uh, this co2 into say syngas and syngas is a feed for you know, like the fuel craft reactor and many other chemicals the challenge here is while activating co2 okay or while converting co2 into any useful product you need energy so you need to minimize that energy input and you need to take energy from renewables like solar energy for example using solar energy if you can convert co2 into say methanol is a good option so there is a lot of literature available and you can uh, contact us separately we'll explain you yes you can go for the next question if there is okay sir okay okay next question is from rashmi although the use of vehicles has reduced in this pandemic situation as a result of lockdown thereby decreasing the pollution and carbon footprint but is there any remote possibility that this online mode of communication is responsible for any sort of carbon footprint accumulation see if you are reducing your transportation need it is all this good okay you need to reduce your transportation need you need to plan your uh, you know like uh, cities well okay and as we are working from home as many people are staying in worldwide it is becoming one of the important ways to communicate and work why not okay it will reduce a lot of uh, energy footprint because you need not to go to another place what you are consuming is a little bit of energy through your pc but you are not uh, moving from one place to another place so yes this is one of the lessons we have learned that whatever we can do from home we should be able to do that we should not have unnecessary trips i don't mean that social trips are not required yes we it is required but minimize it okay uh, the last question is from chemistry learners as we have witnessed clean and green environment do you think government should apply the lockdown of one day in every month no because i am sure you are sitting comfortable at your home and enjoying the lockdown okay you must have seen the migration of uh, lakhs of the people you must have seen the uh, you know like economic activities are you know like shutting down the only way to do is to have a sustainable way of producing anything sustainable way of industry sustainable way of development okay lockdown is not the solution we can easily survive we can easily progress we can have all the activities very easily the only thing is we need to do that in a more responsible way in a more efficient way there is no need of lockdown yes sir uh, thank you so much this is the last question this was the last question yeah nitin sir thank you very much okay. for the excellent session uh, good questions also popped up and uh, you have answered them very nicely so it was a pleasure listening to you uh, Maharashtra Institute of Technology which is popularly known as MIT Aurangabad is a leading institute in the state of Maharashtra and mainly catering to the techno managerial education at undergraduate as well as postgraduate level apart from having conventional courses like civil engineering mechanical engineering electrical engineering computer science and electronics engineering we also have the specialized courses like agricultural engineering and plastics and polymer engineering apart from this we also have the postgraduate courses in mechanical engineering electronics engineering computer science engineering and food processing technology at mtech level we also have mba and the research centers are available for doing phd in mechanical engineering and electronics engineering highly qualified faculty members is the backbone of mit aurangabad and we have faculty members 
having their qualifications like mtech and phd from very renowned institutes within india like iits and nits as well as the reputed universities from abroad mit is always known for the state of the art laboratories right from its inception and now we have introduced a new concept of micro enterprises under which we have introduced two new laboratories namely one is mit cars that is center for analytical research and studies in which very high end equipments are available for soil testing water testing food testing and even environmental testing second laboratory is msip which is mit center for industry relevance in polymer science in this laboratory the actual production machines are installed and students are not required to go to industry for their implant training or to see the actual production in this laboratory itself they can learn all these things so learning regarding the production as well as all operations can be done in this laboratory by all the students So in eighth semester, all our students go to industry for their implant training. For successful implementation of this activity, we have the tie-up with uh, more than 300 industries, which regularly offer implant training to our students, and thereby the placement is also enhanced for all our students. With best infrastructure and very good faculty members and the student-friendly environment, we are able to attract even the international students on our campus. And hence, I would like to invite all the aspirants to come to MIT and experience this joyful learning on the vibrant campus of MIT Aurangabad. Come, explore, and understand MIT Aurangabad. <laughs>